Hi friends, I'm Rebecca. Welcome to Squintillions. Today I'm addressing the issue of online privacy and social media platforms. I have struggled to find the balance between sharing personal information when trying to make a connection with others and protecting my own and my family's privacy. I see some of my online friends and many content creators sharing their innermost thoughts and detailed stories about their lives on social media platforms. In many instances, there seems to be a complete disregard for maintaining any shred of privacy. I wonder if these people have not thought about how the information they are sharing could be misused, if they are unaware of how their personal information can be collected and sold, or if they just don't care about it at all. In this video, I'm going to share my story of how I started paying more attention to the information that I'm sharing online. I'll go over what I've learned about privacy and discuss ways that you can protect yourself online. When I was a young adult, the internet started to become more widely used and the concept of online privacy never crossed my mind at the time. In college, I used email to keep in touch with friends and family in other states. I used message boards and chatted with friends and strangers via online games, sometimes sharing personal details without a second thought. When my first son was born, I wrote a blog all about him for a few years to keep my family up to date on all his milestones and the fun places we would visit together. While I wasn't encouraging anyone else to read it, anybody could happen upon the blog and through reading, figure out the general area where we lived, places we went to regularly and when. A few months after my second son was born, I signed up for Facebook. Many of my high school and college friends were already on Facebook. Members of my family started getting accounts too, and so I began growing my friend group and sharing many of the same things that I would have put on the blog on Facebook. Except now I could make shorter entries and not have to sit down and write one long post. I could share thoughts, photos, and videos quickly and easily. I felt like I could write about whatever I wanted and not just talk about the latest things the kids were doing. The blog about my kids eventually wound down. Much later, it occurred to me to make the blog private to protect the safety of my family. So I happily lived my life out on Facebook, which became an online diary of sorts for me for a few years. That was until the year I was separated from my now ex-husband. Soon I was being careful of what I was posting on Facebook because I no longer felt comfortable sharing everything I did with my ex or his family or even some of our mutual friends on Facebook. A few years on from that, I had a problem that was 100% related to my Facebook presence, and it didn't have anything to do with my ex. This personal story is a prime example of why people should think about their privacy settings. A young guy who fell under the friend of a friend category, who I didn't even know, took issue with a group photo from a public event that he happened to be in. I had posted it on my Facebook page in a public photo album and it was actually about three years old when he came across it. There was nothing odd about the photo. It was a group of people smiling for the camera. He messaged me about the photo, not remembering having been in it. I decided to delete the photo from my Facebook album. Then he started to send me weird and harassing messages about it, posted a screenshot on his timeline tagging me, and even messaged some of my friends. I blocked him promptly. I've been online for a very long time and I realized that the incident with this guy was an outlier. However, that experience led me to greatly change my privacy settings on Facebook. All posts, videos, and photos were changed from either public or friends of a friend to friends only. I've made it so that I am the only one who can see posts I am tagged in on my timeline. I am the only one who can view my friends list. I rarely post about somewhere I'm going to be in advance of going there, and I wait until I'm back home to post about places I had gone out to, if I share the details at all. It isn't merely on a personal safety level that people should be wary of how they are interacting with social media. I recently finished reading the book Zucked, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe by Roger McNamee. The book dives into the story of the growth of Facebook and the failure of the company to protect the privacy of its users' data, its careless attitude to misinformation, and the arguably unscrupulous use of its algorithms to feed people polarizing content to increase interaction rates. One of the most interesting chapters I read was one called the Children of Fog. Stanford professor B.J. Fogg wrote a textbook called 
persuasive technology. Here's an excerpt from the chapter in Zuck about Professor Fogg and his work. Professors at other universities teach the subject, but being at Stanford gave Fogg outsized influence in Silicon Valley. His insight was that computing devices allow programmers to combine psychology and persuasion concepts from the early 20th century, like propaganda, with techniques from slot machines, like variable rewards, and tie them to the human social need for approval and validation in ways that few users can resist. Like a magician doing a card trick, the computer designer can create the illusion of user control when it is the system that guides every action. Fogg's textbook lays out a formula for persuasion that clever programmers can exploit more effectively on each new generation of technology to hijack users' minds. Prior to smartphones like the iPhone and Android, the danger was limited. After the transition to smartphones, users did not stand a chance. And another selection on the following page. The artificial intelligences of companies like Facebook and Google now include behavioral prediction engines that anticipate our thoughts and emotions based on patterns found in the reservoir of data they have accumulated about users. Years of likes, posts, shares, comments, and groups have taught Facebook's AI how to monopolize our attention. Thanks to all this data, Facebook can offer advertisers exceptionally high quality targeting. I am fully aware of the irony of using YouTube to share this message with the public. I'm not suggesting that people completely abandon these platforms, but to be mindful of what personal data you are sharing, how the platform algorithm is influencing your use, and to be vigilant of trolls and bad actors. I've significantly locked down my Facebook account and I'm careful not to give too much specific information about myself here on my YouTube channel, such as not stating my last name or what town I live in. And even though I talk a lot about personal finance on my channel, I won't be revealing my net worth or going into full details on my entire investment portfolio. I like to give people the benefit of the doubt when interacting online. On the other hand, I report spammers whenever I see it in the comments section anywhere on YouTube. I will not approve for posting or will delete questionable comments on my own channel. If we all make an effort to help keep the spam out of comments, I believe it provides a better user experience for everyone. Back to Zuck, author Roger McNamee presses further than mere awareness on multiple issues. As for personal data, he believes that companies should not be allowed to collect user data and then claim ownership to it, that each person should own his or her own data and be free to move it or sell it in a competitive marketplace. He suggests that there be greater regulation of internet platforms in order to slow their growth and change incentives to change behavior. Ideas for other improvements are offered and provide food for thought on this vastly expanding technological landscape. I certainly learned about topics I knew little about before and it has made me even more careful about what I am doing online. This book should be read by anyone who regularly uses large online platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and Google. Even if you aren't in agreement with McNamee's proposed solutions, you will certainly be challenged to assess what you value in an online platform and the ethical use of the technology. Let's move on to some tips for protecting your data privacy online and enhancing your user experience while still allowing you to enjoy your favorite online platforms. Apologies if some of these seem obvious to you. What is obvious to one person might never have been thought of by another. Even these suggestions may not provide you with 100% security, so be conscientious of what you are doing online. If you are interested in further information about this topic, head to the website of the National Cyber Security Alliance at staysafeonline.org. Here are my favorite tips from that organization regarding social media. Number one, once posted, always posted. This is something I am repeatedly reminding my teenage son about. Once you post something, assume it is out in the world forever. You don't know who took a screenshot of a message you have sent, a photo you have posted, or a comment that you have made. The delete button does exist, but that doesn't mean you will be able to delete something before someone else has copied it. Always think carefully about what you are posting. Don't post things that are inappropriate or that you would be uncomfortable with certain people, like parents, teachers, people you are dating or have dated, or future employers seeing. Number two, keep personal info personal. 
Be cautious about how much personal information you provide on social networking sites. Do not give away detailed information about yourself so that someone could use that information to steal your identity, access your data, or commit other crimes, such as stalking. For example, don't fill out those Facebook surveys asking you 20 questions about your preferences or things that you have done in life, as the answers may reveal the information you have given for similar website security questions. Number three. Privacy and security settings exist for a reason. Use the privacy and security settings on social networks. If you are particularly tech savvy, remember that there are articles online and YouTube videos that will help you adjust your settings. For example, you can set up your Instagram account so that it is completely private and all interested followers have to be approved by you rather than allowing anyone to follow your account. Number four, know and manage your friends. Think twice about what information you are sharing with which group of people. Use a separate profile or page if you have a blog or small business so that people who are interested in that content can engage with that information and don't see posts of you out to dinner with friends or playing with your kids. I went through a phase of accepting friend requests from people that participated in various online groups I was active in, even if I hadn't met or interacted much with that person. At the time, I thought, you can never have too many friends. I have since cleared out a bunch of those people from my friends list, and now I am much more cautious about who I accept as a friend on Facebook. Number five, own your online presence. Your content, your choice. Set your privacy and security settings to your comfort level for information sharing. Know that it is all right to limit how and with whom you share information. It's also okay to decide not to share information at all, even if it is the kind of information that you see other people typically sharing. Number six, unique account, unique passphrase. Create separate passwords or passphrases for every account to stop cyber criminals. You can make your passwords longer by using memorable short phrases and more secure by sticking numbers or symbols in the middle. There are also random password generators available online where you can set exactly the criteria you need to make a password for a website. If you have difficulties remembering multiple passwords, my own password list currently has about 180 entries. Consider using a password manager, such as 1Password. If you don't trust online password managers, you can keep a running list of your passwords in a notebook that you keep securely locked away or hidden in your house. Make sure to stash it where you can access it if you need to add to it or look something up, but not where someone visiting your house or breaking in would easily come across it. You may also want to avoid answering the security questions precisely. If the security question asks for your pet's name, it is perfectly okay to not answer spot, but to make up a phrase like, Spot is a beagle, or type in a string of random letters and numbers. You can write down your security questions and answers too. Social media platforms have made it easier than ever to create and share personal information online. Follow these tips and stay mindful of what you are putting out into the online world. If you are interested in the subject, check out the book Sucked, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe by Roger McNamee. A couple other books dealing with the ethically questionable side of social media, which I am interested in reading but have not yet read, are Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked by Adam Alter and Messing with the Enemy, Surviving in a Social Media World of Hackers, Terrorists, Russians, and Fake News by Clint Watts. If you enjoyed this video, remember to hit the like button so YouTube can feed you more videos like this one. If you are new to my channel, please subscribe. I'm going to be creating more content on topics I've been thinking about such as this, as well as continuing to post about personal finance, all here on Squintillions.